It has been 20 years since the world, according to Garp, put author John Irving on the top of the bestseller list. Since then, he's written such critically acclaimed books as his Cider House, Rules, and A Prayer for Owen Meany. In his latest novel, A Widow for One Year, he revisits the theme of loss and grief and love in what many critics are calling his best since Garp. I am pleased to have him here. Welcome to the broadcast. Tell me about this since it's a novel and some people here uh, have not read it yet. Well, I first, long before I thought of writing again about a writer, yes. which, um, which the last time I did, I said, I'll never do that again. Uh, so many friends, when I was writing The World According to Garp, said, what's your book about? And I'd say, well, it's a writer. And they'd look up upon me with the greatest pity. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. I mean, We've it, done it, that, John. Poor fool. <laughs> He's writing about a writer. Um, so I, I had a little more confidence this time that it might not turn out too badly. Um, but long before this character was a writer, uh, she was first and foremost a woman, and I wanted to choose deliberately uh, three views in a woman's life, her childhood, uh, when her mother leaves her, um, when she's uh, uh, a woman in her late 30s, unmarried, with a personal life who's not nearly as, uh, not nearly as successful as her personal career, um, and then when she's a widow and has a child the same age she was when her mother left. Those junctures in her life seemed to me to uh, define a kind of crisis period in, in, in her life. And the book grew up around those three acts, like a play. What, was it personal that you wanted to write about a woman? No. The, the nature of the things that bother her, um, her sense of guilt and self-deprecation for having a sexual past, uh, that made her, to me, uh, a woman. Men are permitted to have sexual pasts, provided we don't egregiously repeat them. Sure. Yeah, or, uh, or but, with um, some element of discretion or whatever. Yes, but but uh, a, a, a woman for is 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 judged not only more harshly by society, but she judges herself more harshly for sexual misjudgments in the past. And so from from that focus, a, a woman who uh, uh, who grows up without a mother and with a father who's a terrible womanizer and who herself is sexually angry, um, uh, sexually insecure. Um, uh, all kinds of things pointed to her being um, a woman. I've, I've, I've had strong major minor women characters in novels before, but, but this novel began with a main character who, uh, who was a woman. And her mother, the woman who disappears for 37 years, is, if not the main character of the book, certainly I think it's its main emotional force. Where did the idea come from? You know, a novel doesn't begin so much with an idea for me as it begins with a sense of person uh, and a sense of what happens to the person. Uh, the overall idea of a book um, it comes later. It, it, it's, you it, begin with a character? I begin with a character. And, and in this case, um, uh, I began with um, uh, a last line. I often begin with a last line. Um, or I don't begin writing a book perhaps for sometimes six, sometimes 18 months, until I've seen enough of the story so that I know what the ending is. The, uh, I, I get to the ending first, and then I work my way back to where I might uh, want to begin. In, in well, the let me understand that. You start with a character. Mm -hmm. And in your mind or through something, some activity with a pen or in a typewriter, you begin to write things, or you just think it out until you, in your head, have this character going through something that ends up in the last chapter. The outcome is very important. I mean, the, uh, the sentence that, be, that became the last chapter in The World According to Garp, in The World According to Garp, where all terminal cases, um, was one of the first sentences I wrote down. And for a while, I, I, it was the first sentence of one chapter, and then it was the last sentence of another chapter, until finally I thought, no, that's the end of the book. And, and when I had the end of the story, I could work my way back. In this case, I thought of a mother who doesn't see her daughter for 37 years. When she walks into her daughter's house, her daughter bursts into tears, and the mother says, uh, don't cry, honey. honey. It's just Eddie and me. And it took me another six months to know how I wanted to echo that line at the beginning of the story. In other words, I, I, wanted, I wanted a line as close as possible to the beginning of the novel that was a reflection of what she would say at the end. And what's the writer's work in between those two points? I mean, is it for you? Is it, how did the story unfold? How do you, would characters come in to affect this character? What is it that goes on for you in your case? Well, in my case, it's, it's almost a grocery list. It's, um, it's a list of details. I mean, Auden used to say that before there could be a poem, there had to be some act of noticing. You had to observe something. Yeah. And, and I spend maybe as much as, uh, as a year 
just uh, taking notes about um, who the characters are, where in the story their paths are going to cross, for what periods of time in the story they're not going to see each other again, uh, where the gaps are, where the junctions are. I mean, you, you, you have to know those things, or I do. People sometimes think it's strange that I, I follow this, this 19th century model of, of a plot-driven right, novel. Right. But I, I don't know how to tell a story. Um, I wouldn't know how to begin a story if I didn't already know what happened at the end. Uh, no more than I think most of us would, would, would walk into a dinner party with uh, some of our best friends and say, an amazing thing happened to me today at the airport if you didn't know what happened. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I mean, I can't wing those things. I have to know what I'm going to say before I start to say it. And the process, if anything, for me has slowed down to the extent that I now spend a longer and longer period of time taking notes before I commit myself to a, a first sentence. I don't want to write that first sentence un, un, until I feel uh, I, I have not just the outline of the book, but, but even the tone of voice already in my mind. Is it harder for you knowing what to say or knowing how to say it? Well, they're not exactly synonymous, but, but synona, let me try that again. They're not exactly, they don't all, always go together. Exactly. It's one of those words like tangerine <laughs> that I had trouble with as a child. I used to say the thing like an orange. Um, I think that the events of a book, um, the vital episodes, the, the, the crucial incidents, the, the, the areas where the story pivot, um, I have to know those things first. And then how to say it. Um, is a matter of what degree of grief, uh, what degree of uh, something uplifting, uh, what degree of sadness there is at the end. That's why I don't think you can find a tone of voice to tell a story um, until you know how it feels when the story is over. There's always a sense for me of an epilogue, of, of, of an aftermath, of um, how does the end of the story affect you. And if you don't know how it affects you, then I, I don't think you know what tone of voice to, be, to start to tell that story in. But the brilliance of use of the language is just there, yes? I mean, well, it's I mean there. that's I, what a writer's craft is about. I think... In part. In part. In, in part. I, I, I feel that the, the strength of, of my language is, is, is largely the result of um, my capacity for revision. Really? I write terrible first drafts. You do? My, my, the first you mean sentence, they're, they're bland, they're but, mundane, they're... The, no, the first sentence out of my mouth is as difficult as trying to say synonymous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's always a clumsy thing. Urban, I mean, it's, Urban confesses here. No, 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 I mean, I think it's, it, it's, it, it's a part of my memory of being a student, which was hard work for me and, and, and something I was never very successful at, that I, I, I took it as a given that nothing would ever be right the first time, that... that if something were to get good, it, it would only become so out of, out of rewriting, out of revision. And so I, I think that, that, that when I'm pleased with the language um, uh, of, of my stories, it's only because that language is, is worked on. You, you, you make yourself sound the same. You don't always sound the but same. But isn't you, that probably true with Faulkner and Hemingway and Fitzgerald and, and so many? There are many writers who are more talented than, than I am and who sort of get their... Um, uh, you know, with, 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 with a little uh, more ease. So there are some writers who were notorious at not revising or not needing to revise uh, very much or not caring enough to uh, re revise very much. Good writers? Um, I think so. I, I, I don't see a great deal of evidence that, um, that, that, that Faulkner was a big rewriter. Yeah, but Hemingway um, said he edited at least everything he'd ever written at least 30 times. Well, he came, he came from a newspaper background where, where that was um, the expected way you worked. Um, I've looked at Dickens's manuscripts, and, uh, and? I'm, I'm amazed at how busy they are. I'm amazed at, at, at what at, went into making the final yes, product. Yes, yes, yeah. I, 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 I love it. It, it, it gives me some um, a measure of confidence that um, it's it's okay to sort of make carrots and arrows and write on the back of the yeah. page and change the color of ink and all of that. I still write in longhand. Uh, Why? I just love it. I mean, I love it. It's the, tactile and everything. It, it is tactile. It's it, it's like I think someone who's a graphics artist who likes to draw. I mean, I just like having a, a, a pen in my hand. If I look at a page of TypeScript and it's clean, I think, well, somebody hasn't written. Well, it. have you tried writing with a word processor at all? With I a computer? spent one summer. Um, a company was was kind enough, um, or perhaps <laughs> perhaps IBM. they were entrepreneurial <laughs> enough. Um, to give me a computer for one summer when I was doing nothing but writing book reviews. 
I was in between books yeah. and I was writing some reviews. And I found it a very useful tool for writing letters and for writing things in short form that you needed to revise quickly. But that's the antithesis of how I spend my life. I don't need to revise quickly. I need to be as slow as I can be. And uh, I don't want something in my life as a novelist that speeds up the process of revision. I think the process of revision should be uh, as, as uh, slow as you can make it. The, the character of Marion has uh, what kind of beauty? are we talking about here? Well, I, I, I don't want to um, put her character to a, 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 uh, the face of a movie star or something. I know, because um, that sounds... I, 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 don't, I, I don't see her... But it's stunning. Uh, it's stunning. It's something that, that, that's arresting and that um, uh, it makes her someone you, um, uh, you, know, you, you, you look at with a sense of her whole life. Um, as her um, young admirer says, um, even when she's in her uh, 70s. Um, I suppose um, it, what you said at the beginning, that, that, that it, it's, it's a book about grief, it's a book about loss. Um, to me, her dead children um, are the most present characters, although we never meet them uh, when they're alive, are the most present characters in the first part of this novel. And Marion's absence from the story uh, when she leaves her daughter at, at, at the age of four, um, and she's gone for uh, 37 years. Her absence, to me, um, uh, de defines the sense of loss that is the book. So that even though she's a character who's, who's on page for less than a third of the novel, um, to me, she's, um, uh, her strength of presence is, is really what makes everything happen. It's because of what happened to her children and because of what happens to her daughter when Marion takes herself out of her daughter's life that the whole story exists in the first place. And, and so in a way, although she's a minor character, um, she's major as a force. And I, I just feel it was best um, uh, to describe her as at the age of 39 she first strikes this 16-year-old boy who falls in love with her and who is in love with her when she's 76 years old at the end of the book. A Widow for One Year um, is about grief and loss and all the things we've been talking about. Uh, yet every novel you've ever written you have characterized as a comic novel. I say in this book somewhere, I think um, maybe Ruth says it about herself, um, but I've said it um, elsewhere about myself that I think there are many things you can decide to be uh, as a novelist. I think you can decide to be uh, more or less autobiographical. You can certainly always decide to be historical or contemporary. You can decide to write a book in the third person voice or the first person voice. Um, you can decide who the characters are. Um, but I don't think you have any control um, over the degree of comedy uh, that there is in your voice, the degree of sarcasm, the degree of facetiousness, the degree to which something comic undermines even the most serious moments of the story. I think it just comes out that way. I can't plan to be funny. Um, I'm terrible at telling jokes. I can't think of something funny I'm going to say ahead of time. It, but it, comedy, is, it, but it, is, it, it, it is embedded in your language. It is. It's a part of the language. I mean, and it, it's no surprise to me that, that the writers I most admire today, uh, Garcia Marquez, Gunter Grass, um, uh, Salman Rushdie. Um, Not he, an American among them. Uh, Robertson Davies, who's a Canadian who, who died just recently. Yeah. They're all 19th century storytellers. They all write plotted novels, and they're all comic. You know, an, an exception to that, um, who was a great hero of, uh, of mine as a reader, was, was Graham Greene. I, I don't think, for example, that uh, Robertson Davies could write a book that wasn't comic uh, to save his life. I, I don't think Graham Greene uh, really knew how to be funny. It, you are the way it comes out, you know, and, and that's a part of your voice that you can't uh, uh, choose. You can't choose that. Why do you think you're a writer? Well, my earliest indication of, uh, of, of wanting to be a writer was, was actually not, not out of being a reader, which I was, but um, out of um, uh, a persistent desire to spend a lot of time by myself. Uh, I had friends. I wasn't unpopular. Um, I wasn't antisocial as a kid. But um, I couldn't wait to get home and just go to my room and be by myself. So long before, long, <laughs> I mean, if, if you don't want to spend well, a lot of time, thank God you found writing. Yeah, I mean, if you don't, that's true. I mean, there's, <laughs> we, there's a lot of things you can do. We would have you really in a straight jacket yourself, by the, yeah, right. right. No. Yeah. So. And and I mean, when did you know you had talent? 
Oh, I always doubted it. I mean, you did I, always doubt it, did you? Some there is about. Uh, I. I, I knew I could accomplish something, but it seemed to me that the, that, that the accomplishment was, was always going to be seven-eighths discipline and one-eighth uh, ability on my part. Seven-eighths discipline and one-eighth ability. I had a wrestling coach who characterized me that way, and it did me a great service, actually. He said, uh, you, know, um, you know, frankly, you're, you're not a very good athlete, um, um, but um, if you work hard, you, you'll be able to... Um, uh, meet with a measure of success. Um, Interesting thing about that, John, is that so many people that come to this table you know, who are the best at what they do, regardless whether it's writing or playing a sport or politics or medicine, they all feel that way. 99% of them think that the difference that enabled them to achieve whatever it is was perspiration, was dedication, was discipline not because they were smarter, more gifted, you know. Occasionally, an athlete will come in and say, I have nothing to do with my, ability, my hand-eye coordination. It's not yeah, something we, I earned. We've all seen those athletes, yeah. and, 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 and to us mortals, um, uh, they, they certainly seem uh, godlike. They, they always have but to But most me. of the people in other areas don't say it's because I had a better, bigger brain, better, smarter, wiser, whatever. I it's think they're right. I mean, I, I, I think that... Um, uh, you know the the test of any accomplishment is um, is how self critical you can be. If you can't um, if you can't be self critical, uh, you, you may do something that's pretty good, but you'll never be able to make it any better. Um, if, if you're not able to sort of um, uh, attack your first effort and break it down and sort of um, have and, you and been, build it up. Have you been running against yourself since Garp, in a way? No, not at all. I mean, I think that's a, um, an, an understandable uh, assumption when you, when you go from a position of being, as I was, a, a relatively unknown writer uh, to being a very well-known one. And when the book um, comes sort of mid-career, right. Garp was my fourth novel, right. um, this is my ninth. Uh, but in fact, because I love to write long books, because I love to spend a lot of time writing a book, uh, I, I, I like to work slowly. Um, uh, Garp changed my life only in, in very positive ways. Uh, quite frankly, um, there's a huge difference between being able to write eight hours a day, uh, seven days a week, and having to have another day job. Mm. And uh, for the writing of my first four books, Garp uh, included, um, I had to have that other day job. I, I, I taught English. I coached wrestling. Um, I had these things that I always thought I would do uh, by necessity to support myself. I never thought my writing would be self-supporting. And so when it was, uh, you know, when, when suddenly um, uh, at, um, uh, at 36 um, I was supporting myself at what I most wanted to do, it was a luxury uh, for me to be able to do it all day and not have to go give my time over to something else. And I've, I've always, uh, I wake up with that feeling that um, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to write all day because it's all I ever wanted to, uh, to do. And, it, it's easy with hindsight to be grateful for years that were difficult. I certainly wasn't grateful for those years when they were being difficult. But I, I think with hindsight now, it's, it's safe to say um, I benefited from uh, those, those four novels which were written not under adverse circumstances, but simply in two and two and a half hour snatches in a day, which was about all I could give over to mm -hmm. writing a book. And I used to say to myself, if I could do this all day, uh, I might get somewhere. Uh, I mean, ask a doctor to have a medical practice and, uh, un until 10 o'clock in the morning. Ask a lawyer to, um, uh, to be a lawyer and um, have two clients a week. Um, it's, if, if you want to do something, you've got to do it all the yeah. time. You know, it's like walking up the hill with a lot of extra weight on your back. Yeah. Uh, John Irving, a widow for one year. What's the cover? Tell me the significance of this cover. Anything? I know you don't design covers, but... Well, actually, I, I came uh, as close as I ever have to designing this one. Um, I, uh, the, the illustrator, who's a wonderful um, illustrator named Hani Werner, has done um, uh, five of my jackets, and, and of this one I'm most pleased. Um, uh, when um, uh, the mother leaves her philandering husband um, and her four-year-old daughter behind, she takes with her all the photographs of her dead children. Um, and leaves the hooks uh, stuck in the wall. Um, and Ruth believes, uh, that to a certain extent, uh, the daughter, that the reason she becomes a writer 
uh, is because of those picture hooks that she has to imagine to recreate her, her brothers, uh, whom she only saw in their photographs, um, because the mother has taken the actual pictures away. And, and so the, the picture hook is not only um, uh, uh, remindful of, of that loss, uh, of the death of those children, which kind of underlies the story of the book, um, but it's also symbolic of everything the main character has to imagine from what isn't there. Again, John Irvin, a widow for one year. Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure you. To see you again. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.